Good morning, everyone. I'm here today to talk to you about what I think is the defining problem of our age, um, and that is privacy. A lot of you may not know who I am. I've been a, a software engineer for about 20 years. I actually worked professionally in open source at this, this place, sourceforge.net, for the young people in the crowd. This was GitHub before it was GitHub, before there was GitHub. Uh, I, had the, I had the privilege and the honor of maintaining both the, the website and network infrastructure behind it during its heyday when it was really the only game in town. Uh, about 10 years ago, I left SourceForge to join a very small company at the time called Palantir, uh, a company committed to really changing the way that regular people, non-technical people, uh, relate to data and applying that to some of the most important problems in the world. My job title there is senior software engineer, but over the years, I've, I've had a chance to wear a lot of different hats. So uh, permit me just a very quick aside. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we pushed up the code for this thing called Atlas DB. Um, Atlas DB is a transaction management layer that you can place on top of anything that looks like a key value store. Uh, the upshot is that you get the safety, reliability, and consistency of a traditional database system with all the scalability and performance of your favorite distributed data store. So this software is actually used to run the core of our flagship platform. Uh, if big data systems are your thing, but you miss transactions from traditional databases, uh, check it out, or I guess clone it, uh, Atlas DB. Um, I've also gotten a chance in my time to, to work with our privacy and civil liberties team. And, and this is a team that's really focused on the responsible use of data, right? They want to make sure that the, the greatest respect possible is paid to people's privacy. And when we talk about people in data systems, they're called data subjects. And the people who hold the data, the people responsible for it, are called data owners. And this is a job that's sort of a mix of dreaming up new technical controls that you can put on data, and then making sure that those solutions are carefully applied in the field to real data. And in, in that decade, We've seen this data economy emerge, right? Where holding large amounts of data about people has become the core business model of much of the internet sector. And the ease of data collection has been too seductive to resist uh, by government organizations who strive to protect our safety and welfare. So in, in watching the sort of ensuing public debate around this, around the collection and the use of data, we noticed that there weren't any good roadmaps on how to do this right, on how to build responsible data systems. There were a lot of talk about laws and regulations, what they could be, what they should be, and a lot of really vague guidelines around securing your data and writing privacy policies, but no clear manual on how to really implement privacy controls. So we wrote the book. Uh, it came out actually just last month, if you're interested. Uh, the first chapter is fantastic. It's a brief history of privacy. Uh, but the whole point of this is to really give implementers a high-level technical manual on how to build privacy controls inside of data systems, right? And not only that, but give policymakers a menu of options to choose from when specking a new system, pushing forward the art of the possible and well understood. So let's, let's talk about privacy, right? Privacy is actually this relatively new concept in human history, where it, it, until this other new technology was invented called cities, there wasn't enough scale to live any kind of anonymous life. Um, but from the very beginning of the notion of privacy, it's been in tension with technology. And when I say the beginning, I really mean the beginning. So uh, in 1888, Kodak releases the first personal camera, right? You press the button, we'll do the rest. Um, and the exact same year, the, the editorials start appearing about how this is the death of privacy, right? The sedate citizen can't indulge in any hilariousness without incurring the risk of being caught in the act and having his photograph passed among his Sunday school children. So they may have been a little premature in, in, in proclaiming the death of privacy, uh, but in the ensuing years, you know, things have changed a little bit. Um, and now we have government agencies. Oh, that's the wrong logo. I meant this one. Um, uh, we, we have government agencies collecting massive data sets uh, about the citizenry that they're post supposed to protect. Commercial operators who monetize uh, and monitor our, our browsing habits and internet usage um, and the products that we buy and even the acts of publishing that, that are maybe public or semi-private that we perform are sort of recorded in all perpetuity. And what's coming next, which we haven't even got to, is that we're all about to become data owners. In this fully recorded future that we can see coming, we're going to hold a lot of data about all the people around us and we need to know how to manage it responsibly. So how do we fix this, right? We can't roll back. We can't say, oh, well, that technology was cool, but let's get rid of it. The only way through is forward, right? And so I go to the wise words of Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly was the first uh, editor of Wired magazine, um, and he's kind of a techno philosopher. There's a lot of writing about the evolution of technology in society and put out this book a couple of years ago, What Technology Wants. Uh, and in it, he, he fully acknowledges that new technologies sometimes cause new problems. Uh, and the way that you fix those new problems is with, yes, 
more technology, right? Uh, so that's great. We, need, we know that we need more technology, but, but how, do, how, how do we approach this problem, right? So we'll back it up even further, and we'll go to Kevin Kelly's mentor. This is Stuart Brand, a very, very famous thinker. Um, in the 60s, he put out a, uh, a series of books called The Whole Earth Catalog. And The Whole Earth Catalog was about repurposing large-scale industrial tools to use on a small scale in the back to the land movement uh, that, that arose as part of the counterculture movement in the 60s in the United States. And at its core, it was all about access to tools, that with the right tools, uh, you can really foment change. And the back to the land movement peters out, but Stuart Brand keeps um, sounding the same drumbeat. This is the whole software catalog. Uh, he sort of attached himself to the PC movement, which is yet another sort of repurposing of large-scale industrial tools to use on a personal level. Uh, and he created the well, which is sort of the, the, the crucible of internet culture. And you can draw kind of a straight line between this kind of thinking to the rise of the open source movement in the 80s, right? It's all about access to tools. So the GNU tool chain, you know, built by, by Stallman, uh, really made it so that anybody could, could perform software development, right? Apache led to the rise of the modern web, driving the cost of publishing down to zero. Linux gave us a high quality, ubiquitous operating system that was available for free and really changed the economics of enterprise computing, and we're seeing the same thing with Android. In the big data space where I normally dwell, Hadoop is doing the same sort of thing, and maybe Spark is coming up after it, right? Um, so we know that open source creates access to tools. Like, this is the thing that it's been, it's been good from, from, from the beginning. Now, tools, access to tools isn't just, isn't enough, right? The equation looks something like this. It should be tools plus incentives equals change. In this case, the incentives, um, we don't have a lot of power there. We can participate as citizens. The, the incentives have to do with laws and regulations and national policy. But the tools part, that's solidly in our court. So let's break down what it means to sort of take on privacy as the next thing to do. So when I talk about privacy, I'm talking about a specific kind of privacy, not personal privacy, which is really a little bit more like security is protecting your data from other people. Uh, there's great work going on there with like the Tor developers and, and open whisper systems. I'm talking about access to tools for data owners, right? Holding data about other people, right? So the first thing to understand is that privacy is not security. They're very, very similar. They use the same fundamental sort of primitives. Um, but security is about stopping unauthorized access. Um, privacy is about limiting authorized access. You give people access to data, and you want to control what they can do with it. You want to mitigate whatever problems they can cause with it. So the first half of that is access controls, right? Um, access controls. Um, today are, are very binary. You sort of get access to the data set or you don't, or access to the table or you don't. We need things like row and field level permissions. Uh, we need sourcing data on every field so that if the, if, the, if the rules around how that data is used change after it's been ingested, you can update it in the, in the downstream system. Uh, we need non-binary access controls, the ability to, to search into a data set to confirm the existence of data without actually seeing it, and then go through some sort of auto band process to get access to it. We need things like time-based access controls, which let us really um, give people a window into data or give them access to data for a certain amount of time. Um, but access controls aren't enough. Um, any access to data represents a risk, a privacy risk, right? And so. In order to mitigate that, you have to actively monitor the use of that data. And so what we need there uh, are systems that audit all access to data, and not just and go beyond sort of a simple query log, right? You need to be able to actually, especially with the distributed nature of modern systems, pull in all the different actions that people are taking across the cluster, put it together, and match it up with some kind of user intent so you can understand what the user was trying to do. And these, these auditing data sets can get very, very large and unwieldy. Um, and so what we need is good infrastructure around, like, applying machine learning to them, good UI for the people who look at it, so that you can very quickly move through these data sets, find malfeasance, and mitigate it, right? Um, so we live in this world where we know that defaults matter. As companies and governments continue to collect data about people, we want the conversation to go from where it is today, which is, I'd love to protect privacy, but I don't have the time or budget or expertise to do so, to I have access to the tools I need to easily and cheaply do the right thing with my data, right? And so, this is why I'm standing before you today. Um, I'm here to beseech you, right? We can fix this mess. We can change the economics, the dynamics, the rhetoric around this problem. We can focus our efforts on shipping open, high-quality, responsible data systems that have privacy baked in from their first commit. We can do what open source has always done, which is invent the world that we want to live in. Thank you. <laughs>